Well, hello, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. And it's a real treat to do this talk as part of ALTAC and uh, our mission statement of making academic research accessible outside of the ivory tower of academia. So I'm Ali Thomas. I am a co-founder of uh, ALTAC UK. Um, I also uh, teach at the University of Wolverhampton and the Open University. And this evening, I'm going to be discussing free zone Scientology. What is free zone Scientology? What's it all about? And um, what does it tell us? Beg your pardon. What does it tell us about wider conversations and debates in the academic study of religion? So what I'm discussing this evening is the um, is a small bit of what was my doctoral research project. I uh, have studied Scientology pretty much consistently for the past 10 years. Um, so the way that this research came to be is that I was an undergraduate in the study of religions in Wales, and I went on a field trip to uh, New York, which was rather fabulous. And while we were there, we got a tour of the Church of Scientology and I, uh, Church of Scientology, and I was just fascinated by um, what Scientology is and how it seemed to very much reflect contemporary issues at the time that it was formed in the 1950s, particularly the boom in self-help therapy that uh, very much informs Scientology's thinking. So I went on an academic research uh, project uh, on Scientology throughout my master's and then throughout my PhD. So it's culminated, and I'm going to do a little plug, in this book that I have in my hands, which you may be not able to see because of motion blurring and so forth, but there's a picture of it in the slide as well. Uh, it's called Free Zone Scientology, Contesting the Boundaries of a New Religion. And um, this is pretty much me drawing uh, my time with Scientology to a close. Um, I've recently moved on to a, a new research topic uh, in my uh, academic ventures, and um, so I'm I'm leaving Scientology behind uh, to do other things, other research. But uh, as you'll probably be uh, able to tell as I talk this evening, uh, I always enjoy coming back to the topic of Scientology, and I always enjoy talking about it. Uh, so this will be a really enjoyable session. So um, while the Church of Scientology was founded in the 1950s by L. Ron Hubbard, who is now famous for being the founder of Scientology, um, I want us to begin this evening's tale in October 1983, specifically at the Crown Hotel. The Crown Hotel was at the time in East Grinstead uh, in the uh, south of England. And it was just around the corner from the uh, Church of Scientology's British headquarters. Now, at this point in Scientology's history, Scientology has had been a movement since the early 1950s. And there had been uh, schisms and various offshoots of people using Scientology in various places and in various ways. Um, it was around this period that the phenomenon of free zone Scientology particularly came uh, became apparent. And in this slide that I'm showing to you, you can see a screenshot from a video uh, that still exists on YouTube. And I find it absolutely fascinating viewing because this is very much a visual representation of free zone Scientology emerging. This is a screenshot of a man called Captain Bill Robertson. And Captain Bill, as he was known, had gathered a group of Scientologists at the Crown Hotel to discuss the future of Scientology, his place in Scientology, and what the Church of Scientology was becoming. Now, it's important to note here that um, Captain Bill's statements were um, very much laced in what people would describe as conspiracy theories. Um, there were a lot of unverified uh, facts being delivered and so forth. But Bill or Captain Bill rather, was a very gifted and charismatic speaker. And if you go and check out that video, um, you, you'll be able to see his, uh, his charisma and his ability as a public speaker shining through. And it was uh, at this event that he essentially told Scientologists that L. Ron Hubbard had lost control of the Church of Scientology. L. Ron Hubbard at this point was still alive, that 
Uh, the Church of Scientology had been taken over by government agents, that um, certain government officials and bodies were attempting to gain control of the Scientology tech, that is the spiritual practice of Scientology, to um, which Scientologists believe uh, help you improve your command of the universe around you and your place in it. And his thesis was that they were attempting to use the tech for their own means. And he says in the middle of his speech that it was now the duty of Scientologists to take the tech, to take the practice and to take the books of R. Ron Howard out of the Church of Scientology and do it elsewhere. Um, he even says that the, uh, the government officials will do, uh, will essentially destroy uh, these books to prevent people from having them. And, uh, and this is essentially the beginning of Free Zone Scientology, Scientology outside of the church. And um, Free Zone Scientology, which uh, is some, this is going to be the focus of my talk this evening, basically. I want to break down the category of Free Zone Scientology and see those little nuances. So while movements had uh, emerged since the 1950s, it was here that we really started to see schisms and large schisms emerging in uh, Scientology and a variety of ways of doing Scientology. So uh, what I like to refer to as I'm uh, doing my work is I like to talk about the notion of Scientologies. I always say there's no such thing as Scientology, a one type of Scientology. There are many different types of Scientologies. And as I say to my students, we don't discuss Christianity, we discuss Christianities or Islams. The S at the end is very important in demonstrating um, diversity amongst religious communities. And of course, the lived religion approach, which I'm going to unpack slightly further on. But the Church of Scientology, the institution founded by Aaron Hubbard, has essentially become synonymous with the category of Scientology. Both are used interchangeably in, uh, in a variety of sources that includes scholarship, uh, well, a lot of scholarship, um, media sources, the news, um, Scientology, Church of Scientology members themselves will use the terms interchangeably as well. And uh, as I noted in my work with uh, Stephen Gregg in, 19, uh, in 2019, rather, not 1999, I'm not that old, um, academic discourses have been affected by the Church of Scientology's very effective marketing of itself as the only form of Scientology. And this idea of authenticity uh, is something that I really want to unpack as we break down free zone Scientology. And for that reason, academic research on free zone Scientology or independent Scientology or any type of Scientology outside the church is very much in its infancy. Uh, academic work on Scientology is quite sparse uh, in general due to a variety of reasons, but the free zone even more so, um, particularly of late, there have been uh, excellent works on independent Scientology from uh, Kirsty Hellesoy. Um, I'm very sorry if I'm uh, mispronouncing your name, but your work is excellent if you are watching this. Uh, Carol Cusack, of course, and James Lewis and Shori. These are examples of very recent works on Scientology outside the church that are bringing a little more nuance to the conversation of what Scientology is and how Scientologists are practicing it. So um, what I'm adopting in this session is a lived religion approach. I'll come to that uh, in a bit more detail in a moment if you're unfamiliar with the idea of lived religion. Um, but what I really wanted to examine in my research was horizontal forms of Scientology. In other words, Scientology in the everyday life of Scientologists. So this is an avoidance of top-down projections from institutional bodies and more seeing what people are doing in their everyday life. Uh, again, as I always say to my students, if you want to find out what Catholics believe, don't speak to the Vatican, speak to Catholics, and you will find that most Catholics do not believe in transubstantiation, for example. And it's the same premise here with Scientology, is that the Institutional Church of Scientology has very carefully um, uh, controlled its image in the public sphere very successfully uh, in terms of presenting itself as the only type of Scientology. And of course, they present a very specific version of Scientology called Standard Tech, which is the tech as they believe that L. Ron Hubbard created it, 
Again, I'll get into that more in a moment. But of course, lived realities always present little nuances and complexities. People don't always get on, people don't always see eye to eye, and people have various ways of doing things. So I think there are three particular sources that we can gather some very uh, enlightening examples of lived religion from. The first are members of the Church of Scientology, and the second are um, free zone Scientologists, or they may be known as independent Scientologists, or Scientology outside the Church of Scientology. It's worth noting that free zone Scientology is often used as an umbrella term to uh, categorize all of Scientology outside of the Church of Scientology. And that seems to be the accepted approach as well in academic research. And of course, as well, um, former Scientologists, ex-members, and their testimonies are also very enlightening as to getting a glimpse of lived realities of what it's like to be a Scientologist outside of institutional uh, dictations. There's a very uh, interesting conversation here, really, in that um, a lot of earlier work on new religious movements, uh, such as that of Brian Wilson, for example, um, did reject the idea of scholars using ex-member testimonies in their, uh, in their work um, on the grounds of bias, which of course is a flawed approach in my opinion. And there has been a shift in the study of new religious movements since then, um, particularly um, Stephen Gregg and George Crusades have published work on what they describe as noisy apostates. Um, particularly, um, they draw attention to how there is a almost a mini publishing industry of former Scientologists writing about their experiences. And these testimonies, these books, these stories from former Scientologists are, of course, very valuable in giving us a lived religion understanding. Uh, Carol Cusack, as well, of course, has uh, also discussed the benefit for scholars using apostate testimonies. And I personally feel that the argument of um, the argument of stating that these former members are biased and will therefore distort information doesn't really hold water because we are all biased. We all approach issues with our own preconceptions, our own biases and our own agendas. We all do that. And for us in the academic study of religion more widely, not just in the uh, sociology of new religious movements, we have to uh, cross triangulate our sources, as uh, George Crusades said. Uh, we have to um, cross reference and evaluate our accounts. And this goes for free zone Scientologists as well, who have their own biases, particularly against the Church of Scientology. And the Church of Scientology have their own agenda as well. Everyone does, and it's not right to um, dismiss ex-members on those accounts. I've personally, for example, have always valued the uh, use of former Scientologists as well. So this is the lived religion approach, in my opinion, to uh, not just uh, free zone Scientology, but Scientology more as a whole. So the free zone. I've given you a bit of an introductory spiel here. What on earth am I talking about? Well, um, one of the easy ways to really define what the free zone is, is to define it by what it's not. And what it's not is the Church of Scientology. So the Church of Scientology, as some of you may very well be familiar, was established by L. Ron Hubbard, uh, who was the developer of the, uh, the faith and practice of Scientology, the spiritual technology, as it's known. And the Church of Scientology is very much an institutionalized body. If you uh, enter a Church of Scientology in New York, or if you do in London, or if you do in Clearwater, uh, or in Edinburgh, wherever, if you find a Church of Scientology, you will find the same materials being provided and um, people being trained in a specific way. It is very organizational. And there's a reason for that, and we'll get to that. And it's found, as I mentioned, across the world in Scientology churches, uh, but are, those are also known as orgs. So if you hear me referring to an org this evening, I'm referring to a Scientology church. And they emphasize a standard tech. So all their staff are trained rigorously in the precise application of L. Ron Hubbard's technology. Of course, it's important to note here that they are being trained in their understanding of L. Ron Hubbard's technology, and this is where some disputes about uh, what Hubbard intended come into play. So the free zone is an umbrella term, essentially. A lot of free zoners don't even like the term free zone, so I avoid using it when I'm referring to the people who reject the term free zone. 
but generally if i'm using it i'm referring to scientology being practiced outside the church and they're very diverse in nature so there can be organized free zone groups there can be free zone individuals who are conducting auditing sessions on their own or simply online with some friends and most of these groups and individuals have very different interpretations of what Scientology should be. There are conversations about standard tech, but not an agreement about what standard tech is. And as I say in my work, I, I like to define the free zone as a fluid social environment, and it's not a series of hierarchical structures. So what I've just described, uh, as you can see in this uh, in this slide, is the development of Scientology, the Church of Scientology, and the eventual schisms. So L. Ron Hubbard uh, wrote a book called Dianetics, the Modern Science of Mental Health, in which uh, he outlined how human beings are being held back, and they are being held back by what's known as engrams in their minds. Engrams are traces of anxieties and neuroses that are associated to past experiences and memories. The idea of Dianetics was to remove that. And you may think, well, that doesn't sound especially religious. And indeed, Hubbard did publish Scient uh, beg your pardon, he did publish Dianetics as a secular text. However, as uh, only a short amount of time passed, Aaron Hubbard started incorporating religious elements into his work. Um, soon uh, he was uh, giving talks and publishing on how auditing was not treating the, um, the body of the individual, it was treating the Thetan. The Thetan is the Scientologist understanding of the soul, and you don't have a Thetan according to Scientology, you are the Thetan. So think of your body as being a car, your Thetan is driving the car and moving you around. So the idea of Scientology is that spiritual therapy of the self, which uh, allows them to achieve things in this uh, lifetime and in this world. So this led to the establishment of the Church of Scientology. And there are a lot of um, interpretations of why L. Ron Hubbard developed what became known as the religion angle of Scientology. But uh, in particular, he um, there are accusations that it was for a financial reason. Um, but uh, I do have to say I am in agreement with Hugh Urban, who said that the reality is a lot more complex than that. There are a number of factors in play as to why he did that. And as well, as we can see from this chart, then schisms began to emerge. So independent Scientology emerged pretty much immediately, maybe not under the name of independent Scientology, but people were doing Scientology outside of the Dianetic centers that Aaron Hubbard was setting up, for example. And then the offshoots of the Church of Scientology. Um, Captain Bill Robertson, after his, um, after his declaration that he was leaving the Church of Scientology, founded what became known as Ronzog. Ronzog exists to this day. There's also the Draw Center in Israel. And more recently, there are, uh, there's been a emergence of Indies, independent Scientologists, and they often draw a distancing between themselves and the original free zoners of the 1980s. So you've got these different camps of Scientologists emerging since then that I find really interesting. And this is just to illustrate what I've been coming back to with um, top-down hierarchy and horizontal fluidity. And uh, this, is, this is very much a representation of how I understand religion in terms of religion, not necessarily being about what people believe, but about what they're doing and what they do in everyday lives and the way they interact with other people. Uh, so the Church of Scientology is now regulated by what's known as the Religious Technology Center. And the Religious Technology Center provides church members with Scientology. They receive the services that they pay for, and um, they receive the books that they pay for, and uh, all the experiences that come with that. Now, the free zone, on the other hand, is a horizontal fluid environment. On the one hand, you have free zone groups like Ronzog that are uh, essentially almost orgs outside of, the, of uh, the Church of Scientology. You have people who call themselves spiritual counselors. I've interviewed a couple of people who um, don't define themselves as Scientologists, but they were members of the Church of Scientology. And there are aspects of L. Ron Hubbard's tech that they find very useful. So they have brought that into their own practices. 
and then you have the independent Scientologists. Now, the reason I've put arrows between these is that they don't, these categories don't ignore each other. There are boundaries between them, particularly based on interpretations of the tech, um, but they often collaborate with one another. So an independent Scientology auditor, for example, may go and uh, do some auditing at Ronzog. There's very much a fluidity between these groups, often leading to some spiritual collaboration, shall we say, and practical collaboration as well. So as I was saying, this is my approach to the academic study of religion. And what I wanted to do with my research was to essentially move beyond the typologies that had dominated the study of new religious movements to date. Um, if you've heard me speak before, you will know that I find the term or rather the category of new religious movements to be unsatisfactory anyway. And I'm very much one of those scholars who says that religion is everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Um, so I'm very much influenced by the work of uh, people like uh, Leonard Primiano and Marion Bowman, uh, particularly their work on lived and vernacular, vernacular religion. And this one quotation from Primiano really sums it all up for me. I look at religion as it is lived, as human beings encounter, understand, interpret and practice it. And that's my thesis. So I move beyond the uh, um, debates of uh, new religious movements that were particularly prevalent in the 1980s, and rather I consider uh, Scientology not from the perspective of NRM studies, but from the uh, from the conversations in the wider study of religions right now. So I'm going to give you a quick crash course on Scientology before I start unpacking some of the complexities of the free zone, and then we can open things up to a discussion because that's always the fun bit, isn't it? So. Um, as I said, Scientology was founded by L. Ron Hubbard. He was born in 1911, died in 1986, and uh, it was based on the theories that he had put forward in his bestseller, Dianetics, The Modern Science of Mental Health. If you have walked through an American city, there's a good chance you've been given a flyer uh, that advertises Dianetics, so you'll be familiar with the volcanic eruption on the cover of the book. The first Church of Scientology was opened in Washington in 1954. And Hubbard led the Church of Scientology throughout his lifetime. He did take a step back in the early 1980s um, to allow the Church of Scientology International to uh, handle bureaucratic affairs, but he was still the leader of the church. And he's known as source among Scientologists, meaning that uh, it means that he's the source of all philosophical and scientific knowledge. And uh, you'll often find Scientologists referring to him as source and just simply simply in casual conversation, things like, oh, I remember Source once said. So uh, terms like Source, Mr. Hubbard, LRH, um, are all used interchangeably. Um, and occasionally they will refer to him as Elron as a term of endearment, uh, almost as if they're referring to a friend. It is important to note, however, that Elron Hubbard isn't seen as a god. In Scientology, rather, he's seen as uh, what Donald Westbrook describes as the model OT, uh, the model operating Phaeton, the model Scientologist, what a Scientologist should be. And uh, the, the core practice of Scientology is auditing, and I'm giving you an outline of what auditing is, because free zone Scientology, I found, is entirely about auditing. It's not necessarily about the wider, more overtly Christian aspects that you may find of the Church of Scientology, such as their church services on Sundays, for example. Um, rather, it's purely about the practice of auditing and the interpretations of this practice is what causes the boundaries and the fluidities that I'm interested in. So as I mentioned, auditing is a process of removing the engrams from your mind, the harmful anxieties that uh, affect an individual. And um, L. Ron Hubbard began to uh, work on religious ideas associated with this practice. Um, he published, well, rather a collection of his writings were published under the title of Have You Lived Before This Life, which is a difficult book to track down. But if you can, it's very interesting because it consists entirely of testimonies from people who, during their auditing sessions, claim to recall experiences from past lives. And this led L. Ron Hubbard to the conclusion that he wasn't treating necessarily the human mind, but he was also treating past lives, i.e. he was treating the spirit. 
So there's some examples there uh, that are comparable to Buddhist ideas, and uh, that has been touched on in academic work in the past. But as you'll see on the screen, an auditing session takes place typically between two people. And this is where it's very important. This is where these distinctions between the church and the free zone become very apparent. The, um, the person running the session is an auditor, a person who's trained in Scientology, trained in the practices of auditing, and they will guide the pre-clear, this is the individual on the other side receiving the treatment through a series of questions and answers that will lead them to removing the engram and being able to um, progress in life. So Scientologists say that uh, engaging with auditing can improve your career, your financial success, uh, your spiritual abilities, your relationships, and so forth. And this essentially comes back to the idea of um, what uh, Brian Wilson in particular outlined as the um, this worldly salvation that you often find with new religions. They're not necessarily associated with the afterlife, but it's about getting salvation in this lifetime through fast methods. And uh, I wanted to also very quickly mention the e-meter you may have seen in that picture of the auditing session in the Church of Scientology that uh, there's a device called an e-meter. It's closely associated with Scientology in many ways. So um, as you can see on the screen, it was free, uh, featured prominently in the South Park episode that lampooned Scientology. Uh, on the left is a photo that I took of an e-meter at the Church of Scientology in London. Um, they were very kind to let me take some photos. And um, it's very comparable to a lie detector in the way that somebody holds the two cans that you see on the screen. And the device um, measures the galvanic skin response of the preclear as they're answering these questions. Uh, according to Scientologists that I met at the Church of Scientology, what they believe is that um, it's not necessarily uh, responding to the um, to the uh, galvanic skin response, it's actually responding to the thetan and to the presence of the engra. So what the e-meter does in a series of complex procedures that I won't bore you with this evening is assist the auditor in detecting an engram and uh, recognizing when it has been removed. You can see in the picture that I took that there's a needle and that needle will move uh, as it's measuring the skin response from the hands of the preclear. And now this brings us entirely up to date. Who you see on the screen now is David Miscavige. He is currently the leader of the Church of Scientology following the passing of L. Ron Hubbard in 1986. And he has led the Church of Scientology since then. So there have only been two leaders of the church. And um, what's particularly interesting about uh, David Miscavige for me is that he's not someone who holds the uh, role that L. Ron Hubbard held. So he doesn't develop his own tech, for example. He doesn't expand on Scientology. He doesn't come up with his own practices and so forth. Um, so he holds the position of the chairman of the board. So he's known as COB for short. And he's the chairman of the board of the Religious Technology Center. And this is an institution that was set up after the uh, death of L. Ron Hubbard to ensure that the work and teachings of L. Ron Hubbard uh, were preserved and were also disseminated amongst church members in what they deemed to be a precise and accurate application. So that's where the Church of Scientology currently stands. But alongside this has been a series of schisms and um, new types of Scientologies emerging, as Carol Cusack has uh, previously drawn our attention to. Various forms of Scientology outside the church emerged very early on. Um, she points particularly to Dianology, for example. But the term free zone, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of this talk, is commonly associated with Captain Bill Robertson, who led the first major schism in the 1980s. And um, his title is very important because a lot of the Church of Scientology's management is run in a Navy style. So they have the Sea Org, for example, which is the uh, naval fleet of um, the Church of Scientology, the members of the Sea Org. You could, uh, you could describe them as almost the monastic community of the Church of Scientology will wear very Navy-esque uniforms, for example. Uh, L. Ron Hubbard was the Commodore, um, so he held a very naval title, and he gave the title of um, Captain 
for Bill Robertson. And the only other person he gave the captain title to was his wife, Mary Sue Hubbard. So he clearly held Bill Robertson in high regard. And the two were very much considered to be fast friends. So when Robertson said that he was leaving the Church of Scientology and that Hubbard had lost control of the Church of Scientology, people started to listen because he had his own charisma that he had almost inherited from uh, Hubbard. His association with Hubbard gave him that uh, charisma that did inspire um, a good number of Scientologists to follow and to leave him. Now, um, what he then did as he got out of the Church of Scientology is he ended up establishing Ron's Org. Um, Ron's Org is an organization outside the Church of Scientology that claims that it practices standard tech. So already you've got the Church of Scientology doing standard tech and you've got uh, Ron's Org doing standard tech, but the two groups would not see eye to eye about what standard tech is. This is where the complexities begin to happen. I will not give you what I think is standard tech. I don't think um, I don't think of anything as particularly being standard tech, particularly because L. Ron Hubbard wrote so much during his lifetime. So when he established the Church of Scientology, he didn't simply put his publications out there to the church members and say, that's it. He continued to write, he continued to publish, and thus Scientology was changing anyway. As scholars of religion, we know that religions are dynamic and fluid. They are constantly changing. Um, so the idea of orthodoxy breaks down somewhat there. Ron Zorg today is primarily based in, uh, particularly in Switzerland. Uh, it's led by Marx Howery, and um, they are estimated, uh, particularly in the work of James Lewis, to be producing more trained auditors per year than the Church of Scientology. So Ron Zorg are pointing to growth, whereas evidence suggests the Church uh, of Scientology membership is um, either stagnating or in decline. But the free zone is a broad category. What I've just told you is how um, uh, Bill Robertson um, left the Church of Scientology and established the free zone, established Ronzog, but actually things are much broader than that. Not everybody prescribes to, uh, Cap uh, to Captain Bill's understanding of Scientology. Um, of course, there are stories that you see shared online. They're quite difficult to verify, um, but it's said amongst a lot of free zone communities that um, Robertson claimed to be in uh, communication with an alien called Elron Elray, which was presumed to be the um, now the soul of Elron Hubbard, communicating to him in an extraterrestrial fashion and communicated more tech to him. So despite the fact that he wanted to preserve standard tech, he still did change Scientology. He did add new elements to Scientology, but it was almost legitimized by the claim that it still came from Elron Hubbard in this uh, in this cosmology. Uh, narrative. Um, many of the free zoners that I've interviewed are very sceptical of uh, his claim, and um, it's very much seen as an individualized understanding of Scientology rather than something he's passed on to many people. So as Lewis has observed in his work, there are two major schisms in Scientology, and the first I've just drawn your attention to is the schism of the 1980s with Captain Bill Robertson. But also there's been a large number of Scientologists leaving the church within the past 20 years, and they call themselves the independents or the indies, and they still get covered by this broad category of the free zone, but often they don't use the term free zone. They would rather say they're Indian independent instead, perhaps maybe because they're distancing themselves from the cosmological ideas of um, Captain Bill Robertson, which some of them have described to me as being quite bizarre. Um, and it's during the leadership of David Miscavige that this has happened. So remember that this initial uh, schism of the Free Zone happened during L. Ron Hubbard's uh, leadership of the Church of Scientology, where he was at the time. We don't know. I'll get to that. Um, but this one has happened during the leadership of Miscavige. Um, so unlike the Church of Scientology, we can already see this fluid social environment of uh, free zone Scientology, many different people practicing Scientology independently away from institutional bodies or regulation. So um, the free zone is not a united group. It's an error to think that they are, and some people do make that error, but there are a lot of 
commonalities between different free zoners, as I call them, um, or independent Scientologists. And these are often their critiques of the Church of Scientology. So the independent Sci uh, Scientology website states right off the bat, Scientology does not equal the Church of Scientology. They say the problem with the Church of Scientology is their actions, not the beliefs. So this is a critique of the Church, not of Scientology. They're often very critical of the disconnection policy, uh, particularly um, it's a process that um, in which Scientologists may disconnect from friends or family uh, who are critical of Scientology or who they feel are holding them back from their experiences in Scientology. It's a very controversial topic with some um, uh, very emotionally charged and powerful testimonies when um, being shared. Um, the Free Zone is often critical of Scientology for their charges for auditing. It is worth noting that many Free Zone Scientologists do still charge for their services, um, but generally they claim that they're not as expensive as the church. Um, they say that the Church of Scientology is changing the tech, which I'll get to in a moment. Uh, this is a really interesting one in that they are saying that the Church of Scientology, not only does it not have standard tech, but it's changing the tech as well. And they're also very critical of the fair game policy. And the fair game policy uh, is a very heavy handed uh, attempt at uh, controlling critics of the Church of Scientology or combating critics of the Church of Scientology. Hubbard did claim to scrap the fair game policy that he established in the name of public relations, but there's still evidence to this day that um, that, uh, that fair game is still in action. And I'll get to that uh, when we discuss Marty Rathbun. But arguably the main principle of independent Scientology is that they don't need a leader. They don't need an organized uh, structure. Rather, they've got the tech, it's all been published. They can just follow the guidance that they've been given by L. Ron Hubbard. And, um, and uh, that you see that particularly with the way that um, Scientologist texts are shared online. And there's a uh, obviously a conversation regarding copyright then from the Church of Scientology and uh, who have copyrighted L. Ron Hubbard texts, which are then being used for spiritual dissemination amongst the free zone. And this is where I come to the uh, a little more of an explanation to the uh, fair game policy. Um, to do Scientology outside of the Church of Scientology is to engage with squirreling. Uh, squirreling was a term that was developed because, um, according to Hubbard, one would have to be nutty to leave the Church of Scientology. Free zone, uh, so squirrels are generally seen as being nuts for doing Scientology outside of the church. And um, it's obviously also become a very derogatory term of people doing Scientology outside the church. And uh, in 1965, aware already that people were buying Dianetics and doing Scientology away from the Church of Scientology, Hubbard published a um, bulletin called Keeping Scientology Working, which was an attempt to really combat the number of people doing Scientology outside the COS. Uh, so Keeping Scientology Working has been described by Donald Westbrook as the crown jewel of Scientology's systematic theology. Here, Hubbard is outlining the almost the orthodoxy of Scientology, the way Scientology should be, the way it should not be practiced outside the free zone, uh, outside the church and in what would become the free zone. And this is a really interesting transition here because of course this was written in the 60s, but many free zoners say that they have L. Ron Hubbard's tech on their side, particularly after the, um, the emergence of Miscavige as the leader of the church. So Hubbard uh, defined squirreling as going off into weird places and uh, altering Scientology. And uh, the idea of changing Scientology um, or altering Scientology has now been uh, extended to the act of simply practicing Church of Scientology, uh, uh, practicing Scientology outside the church, I beg your pardon. Uh, so this makes squirreling, in the words of Shorey, an egregious crime against the church, resulting in excommunication and shunning of members accused of perpetrating these activities. So this is a reason why somebody may be encouraged to disconnect from a, a friend or relative, for example, they may be squirreling. It's seen as being dangerous that um, often the church will say that these people aren't appropriately trained 
to um, disseminate L. Ron Hubbard's work. The picture I have on the screen is uh, a T-shirt worn by the self-styled Squirrel Busters who gathered outside the home of Marty Rathbun a number of years ago. Marty Rathbun was a former very high-ranking member of the Church of Scientology who resigned. And um, at the time, he became an independent Scientologist. He was doing Scientology outside the church. And a group of uh, church members gathered outside his door wearing these T-shirts that have, as you can see, squirrels on them with his face on them and um, were um, um, harassing him outside his house for being uh, for doing independent uh, Scientology. The police got involved and um, there was a there was a, a wider case here as well of details that I don't have time to go into this evening, but it's a very interesting uh, case in terms of the interaction between the church and the free zone, uh, which is hostile to say the least. But to bring this back to the idea of authenticity and how schisms emerge at the heart of the Church of Scientology and its uh, rejection of the free zone is standard tech. The Church of Scientology claims that it applies the tech of Scientology precisely as Hubbard intended it to be practiced in his written work. But what this standard tech is, is contested across uh, Scientologies. Uh, different communities, individuals, groups lay claim to true Scientology uh, through their perception of how the tech is practiced. So for example, in the words of Hellasoy, Ron Zog marks its legitimacy by, by portraying as adhering to true Scientology in contrast to the Church of Scientology, which is teaching a false altered version. So what L. Ron Hubbard intended with his work is contested for a number of reasons. And uh, it's at this point that I want to bring uh, Max Weber in, as I always do, and talk about some Weberian ideas, because what we see here with the Church of Scientology is routinized charisma. As I mentioned to you earlier, um, David Miscavige does not hold the same role as L. Ron Hubbard. He doesn't develop his own tech. Rather, he's the chairman of the Religious Technology Center, which is the institutional embodiment of L. Ron Hubbard's charisma. So Weber wrote that after a charismatic leader, a founder of a new religion, for example, dies, their movement will succumb to the routine, will succumb to bureaucracy, in which he said that rules in some form come to govern. And here we see routinized charisma uh, with the Religious Technology Center. So there isn't an equally charismatic leader following the death of the founder, rather their charisma lives on in the institution. So a charismatic leader, Weber said, is likely to be replaced by an administrative structure, organizational rules, and as he says, above all, officials. And this results in what he termed as the charisma of office, an administrative body that retains the authority and charisma through its association with the leader. So in this uh, case, the Religious Technology Center and David Miscavige and the Sea Org. So Miscavige's role as the leader of the Church of Scientology is legitimized by his preservation of L. Ron Hubbard's work through the Religious Technology Center. The charisma of the office of L. Ron Hubbard lends itself to David Miscavige. And um, this is all based on that principle of keeping Scientology working that I drew your uh, attention to earlier. And the Church of Scientology claims that therefore, churches around the world will provide everyone with the exact same experience, uh, which is a very difficult claim to verify. There's always a level of individualism and interpretation with any practice. But the idea is that um, church members will be given the same books and people uh, are trained auditors who are trained to the same level according to the same tests and so forth. But David Miscavige has almost cemented his legacy even further by um, republications of L. Ron Hubbard's work uh, in two initiatives that really draw comparisons and contrasts to the free zone. These are the golden age of knowledge and the golden age of tech. And this was a republication and uh, remastered audio of L. Ron Hubbard's lectures as well. So all of his books were republished according to what the Church of Scientology said was the way they should have been published all along. So maybe there were errors in dictation, for example, um, or certain parts of the book were placed in wrong places. This is 
100% L. Ron Hubbard as he intended it, which of course is a claim that's coming from the Religious Technology Center and David Miscavige. So you can see where this is going. It's contested by free zoners who do not like these changes or had left beforehand and felt the changes were being made to the tech. So here we have orthodoxy and heterodoxy in action in, in constructing boundaries in Scientologies. So the Religious Technology Center copyrights, trademarks, Scientology ideas. It draws a boundary between itself and the squirrels. And through the routinization of that charisma uh, of Hubbard, um, Miscavige develops the orthodox version of Scientology. However, what we see now with the rejection of church practices and recent uh, church uh, activities amongst the free zone is a reversal of the squirreling dynamic. And this has particularly started to happen since these golden age initiatives. Um, free zone uh, communities are drawing their le legitimacy from L. Ron Hubbard's older work that was published in his lifetime. So Ron Zog, for example, when I interviewed a member of Ron Zog, he told me that they use copies of Dianetics from 1969 because they believe that that is closer to what L. Ron Hubbard intended and that later works may have been ed, um, amended or published not under his name. So um, as Helisai and Lewis have also observed, there's an accusation uh, of squirreling amongst the Church of Scientology by the free zone. So you've got a reversal of this. So L. Ron Hubbard established the idea of squirreling as being people doing Scientology outside the church. But now you have people outside the church saying that no, the church are the squirrels because the church are the one who are changing LRH's work. So that's, I find that reversal fascinating. I interviewed uh, someone called Eric during um, my fieldwork. It's a pseudonym. Uh, all my fieldwork participants have pseudonyms. And he told me, I know of the golden age of tech. It is more bullshit from Miscavige. These changes are not in the LRH vision of auditing. They have two purposes money and to make auditing heavier and longer. The independent field will never consider using it in its practice. The independents are loyal to LRH because it works wonderfully and gives results. So here's very much a claim of authenticity here that true Scientology has now left the church. The independents are loyal to our others, that the Church of Scientology aren't, despite the devotion to our own Hubbard through terms like source, for example, and um, the offices for L. Ron Hubbard that are built into each org that looks as if Hubbard could come back at any moment and continue his work. Um, I'm told by the Church of Scientology that it is simply a tribute. They don't believe that he will, um, but there is a clear level of devotion. And here we see as well that despite this claim that the independents are loyal to L. Ron Hubbard, Debate rages in the free zone regarding Hubbard's authority on the tech. So there are disputes amongst free zoners about are you doing correct Scientology? Are you doing actual Scientology? Are you changing Scientology? Are you combining Scientology with other practices? And there are debates around whether um, Hubbard would encourage Scientologists to develop or adapt the tech to their personal preference. Now, this is a conversation that is never had in the Church of Scientology because Aaron Hubbard is source, the source of this knowledge. But um, there are many free zone discourses that suggest that L. Ron Hubbard would have approved of people changing the tech, of developing it and adapting it to their own preferences. And um, this is uh, with a uh, particular, I've got two quotes here that I find particularly interesting. And um, the heading of this slide is taken from a statement that I had from someone that I've called Chris, the idea of being with LRH or not within with LRH. So this is about these boundaries that are popping up in the free zone. And Chris says, consider the field of free zone Scientology as having two factions, more or less. There are people who are with LRH and the people who are not. The with LRH people are often the most trained and educated in the subject. They insist on precision of application of the technology and adherence to the policies laid down by Ron in relation to the technology. The other people do not run standard Scientology. They mix it up with other things 
or think they have some better idea than Ron about this or that. So Chris is very devoted to L. Ron Hubbard and L. Ron Hubbard's work. And I think this idea that he presents of with LRH and not with our LRH is very interesting. Now, from a critical academic perspective, of course, things are not that simple. There aren't simply two factions of those who are with and those who are against. But it is a very interesting uh, example of how they are perceived by some independent Scientologists. And then we get to the idea of standard tech as well. I interviewed Jeff, who was a spiritual counselor. He was a Church of Scientology who left, a member who left and does not identify as a Scientologist anymore, but he still says that he uses auditing in his spiritual counseling sessions with his patients. And he told me that there is no standard tech. Somebody may have told you this, but standard tech was what Ron Hubbard said at that moment. He said that there is only one standard tech. He said this in 50 to 52. In the 70s, there were three or four different versions of standard tech. In other words, standard tech was whatever Ron realized he was writing at the time. You can see the iterations of standard tech so that if you were pr a practicing auditor as I was, you found that you were really working with this whole bunch of technology that had bandages on. So this is where complexities in free zone Scientology emerge. And uh, every free zoner I interviewed presented a very different version of Scientology and a very specific understanding of Scientology that I feel really does reflect lived religion in action, the complexities of everyday life. And part of this standard tech and um, deviation from Hubbard's work comes down to the debate of authenticity and innovation. So the Church of Scientology claims to be authentic. Ron Zog claims to be authentic. Chris claimed to be authentic. But there are innovators as well who feel that L. Ron Hubbard gave them the right to do so. Uh, on the screen, for example, we have some uh, screenshots from Reddit of uh, some free zone Scientologists who are changing the tech in different ways. The first uh, one you can see is an online uh, auditing session that is not taking part in a face-to-face -face auditing session as per the Church of Scientology and the work of Aaron Hubbard, which is seen as controversial in itself. One person, as you can see there, has an e-meter on their side. I interviewed a free zone Scientologist who said that their patient, their pre-clear, doesn't need to hold the cans of the e-meter. The, the fact that the spirit in Scientology transcends the physical universe means that the e-meter can still pick them up. This is very different to uh, what L. Ron Hubbard wrote and what is commonly understood in Scientology. And the other screenshot, you can see somebody developed their own e-meter app. So now they have cans connected to their computer. Uh, and recently I saw as well that somebody has developed Bluetooth uh, e-meter cans that connect to a computer as well. So the e-meter can now be an app as well as a physical device. And I spoke to a Scientologist called Owen, a free zone Scientologist, who said that uh, all his sessions used to be in face-to-face -face, um, manners as per the work of Aaron Hubbard, but then there was a change and he described it accordingly. He said, I have pre-clears in Australia, America, Germany, and in Sweden. I just sit here and do it. I don't use the e-meter. All of Scientology in the fifties was researched and discovered without the e-meter. An e-meter is, in my opinion, something that L. Ron Hubbard invented in order to be able to train people who couldn't think with the tech, those who needed a tool in order to get involved with the pre-clear's reactive mind. Without the e-meter, you can have a greater presence or a greater range of questions. For many years, I vowed to uh, never audit without the e-meter or on Skype, but then I had two pre-clears here last summer who paid for hotels and thought, we don't want to do this, why don't you audit us on Skype? So I said, if they dared try that, we would give it a go. I've done it ever since. It worked perfectly. It was totally natural. People restrict themselves because they think they can't audit without an e-meter. Bullshit. Auditing works very well without an e-meter. So here we have an individualized uh, Scientology in action. Owen is a uh, free zone auditor. He, sh he uh advertises himself online as an auditor that people can come to him and get Scientology uh, practices from him, can develop um, their uh, experience as a Scientologist, and he is doing it through his own understanding of Scientology, through his own preferences. And this, uh, what I was just referring to with the e-meter, has created almost a free zone uh, marketplace. 
if you will. So um, in the um, in the past, for example, um, the in the work of Swainson, uh, Swainson described Scientology uh, or the Church of Scientology more specifically as a microcosm of neoliberalism by adapting uh, uh, consumerist approaches to uh, religiosity. And Scientology, according to Swainson, in, uh, in their words, uses a literal interpretation of the theoretical spiritual marketplace. So while the Free Zone claims to um, not be as um, money-focused as the Church of Scientology, that is still happening. They are still selling their services, and you can buy e-meters online. And these are all, unlike the very slick and lavish Church of Scientology when I showed you earlier, they often sport a very retro homemade design to them, uh, particularly um, the ability meter model 3A, for example, you can already see from that design, it's a lot more retro than a typical e-meter, it's a lot more homemade. And these often come with little um, tweaks and customizations that are tailored to the needs of the person using it. And people can pick out their own e-meter in the free zone, almost like picking out a phone that does what you want it to do. Um, I want to very quickly, before we go into discussion, um, address what you may have been wondering earlier on about um, authentic texts. I mentioned that um, Ron Zog use uh, copies of Dianetics from 1969. Why don't they use something from, say, the late 70s, for example? Well, this is because there are a number of conspiracy theories in the Free Zone about where L. Ron Hubbard was during those final um, years of his life. He didn't make many public appearances. Um, so Bill Robertson, for example, said that he'd lost control of the church. Um, there were rumors that he had been cloned in the early 1970s and that the L. Ron Hubbard you see from 1970s onwards is a clone. Um, there were others including that he had died and some of his works are not actually published by him, that a uh, charade was put in place almost like a weekend at Bernie situation where they pretended that L. Ron Hubbard was still alive. And these filtered in to conversations I had with free zoners. And here are a few that I had. Owen said, I don't know where he was. I don't know if he was dead or alive. I know nothing. I could just feel that he was not behind the scenes anymore. Tracy said that people instinctively knew something was wrong. There are wild stories like he was put on ice and even dead for years. Chris says, after Ron's death, everything is suspect in terms of publications. Though Ron could have directed items to be issued, which were only ready after he died. And Hansen, a member of Ron's org, said uh, that when he was a member of the Church of Scientology before he left, that management found out that, uh, in his words, that people started to doubt if LRH was around or not. And they released some messages by L. Ron Hubbard. He spoke and we listened and we said, uh, is this the old man? No, that's not his voice. So I don't know what happened after 72. Maybe he passed away. Maybe he was just broken. Maybe he had some other illness or strokes. So this is part of the complexities of standard tech as well. Almost everything is contested in Scientology. And, uh, and this is a particularly tricky issue uh, in determining what particular free zoners understand as Scientology, what they see as authentic Scientology and what isn't. And as we saw as well with the e-meter uh, being an app, people are also changing and innovating Scientology as well. So very quickly to wrap up, um, a lot of religions use the internet nowadays in very obvious ways, but um, one free zoner told me that part of the reason why the free zone has really thrived in an online space is of course they lack the financial resources that the Church of Scientology has in being able to build its orgs and um, its uh, flag superpower building in Clearwater, for example. Um, so the online method has become not just a tool for them to um, meet other Scientologists, arrange auditing sessions, but as an opportunity for them to present their vision of Scientology, because they are very, more often than not, critical of the Church of Scientology. So there's, there's the YouTube channel run by Scientology Girl. Scientology Girl is a uh, independent Scientologist who makes videos telling people what Scientology is and drawing a line between what she understands to be Scientology and Free Zone Scientology. 
She's also a part of what's known as AOGP, the Advanced Organization of the Great Plains. They also lay claim to an authentic Scientology. They say that um, uh, the Church of Scientology has become a mere shell of what it was, once was in delivery, in honesty, and in integrity. We saw the nooks and crannies and decided to be what Ron originally wanted in a true and free-thinking independent Scientology, free of the yoke of the corporate church's suppression of communication, thought, and most of all, an affinity for one another and the subject of Scientology itself. So some thoughts to wrap up. I appreciate I've spoken quite a bit. It's a big topic and I promise I haven't, it's still only a fraction of uh, my research and uh, what I've published on the Free Zone. But these are some thoughts that I really wanted to convey this evening. Firstly, that Free Zone Scientology is not a united movement as they're often understood to be. It's a fluid and dynamic categories. There are divisions, boundaries and collaborations amongst a variety of Scientologists or individuals using Scientologist practices. So understand the free zone as a horizontal network, um, not as a top-down projection of what Scientology is. The innovative practices of the free zone um, point to a breakdown in the Weberian model of routinized charisma. There's very little routine or bureaucracy or institutional bodies in the free zone. Rather, a lot of people doing Scientology in their own way and adapting it in their own way. And finally, I believe that this contrast that I've outlined this evening between the free zone and the church points to wider issues in the academic study of religions, not in simply in the study of new religions, but questions of how religions in transformation and transition in the 21st century adapt to wider issues. And particularly questions regarding how vertical organizational structures aim to control and protect their knowledge and methods and the ways in which people have attempted to sidestep and subvert that. So thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording so that we can have a conversation. If you are listening to this on YouTube, for example, uh, please hit that subscribe button and like this video and um, ask us a question, why not? But, so I'm going to stop it there. Thanks very much, everyone.